Hi, my name is Alex Cassano and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today we'll be having Bill DeYoung. Bill will be speaking about vintage St. Petersburg and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Everybody move forward. <laughs> I get it. Okay. <laughs> it's all about acrobatics today. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bill DeYoung. I was born in St. Petersburg in 1958 grew up in St. Petersburg, so we're talking the 60s and the 70s, essentially. I left to go to college, and I had a career as a journalist that lasted about 35 years. I was the arts editor of the Gainesville Sun for 20 years. Um, most have written about music and theater and fine arts and dance and the other vestiges of uh, theater. But in the last couple of years, I, I, I've taken a, a real interest in the history of the city where I grew up. Uh, my first book, which came out in 2013, is called Skyway, The True Story of Tampa Bay's Signature Bridge and the Man Who Brought It Down, which is essentially, as you might guess, um, the story of the Skyway Bridge disaster in 1980 and the biography of Captain John Lara, the harbor pilot, who uh, became a pariah in his community because people figured something was wrong with him. There wasn't anything wrong with him. Uh, I spent two and a half, almost three years working on that book. I'm very, very proud of it. And um, I, th I think, or I, I hope, that it changed some people's minds about what happened and, and how it happened and, and why it was inevitable that it was going to happen over time. And John Lara just happened to be the guy who was there at the wrong time, on the wrong day, with the wrong storm, on the wrong ship. And uh, when he died in 2002, he, he had contracted multiple sclerosis and could barely move. Um, his was not a happy life. Uh, so I, my, my point in telling you this is that when you're a journalist, I think whatever you do, if you're a news writer, you're a sports writer, anything, or an arts writer like me, you embark on a journey of discovery with every project, even if it's just some mundane thing, you know, I work for the St. Pete Catalyst now, and you might put out three and four stories in a day about something that the city council did, luckily somebody else gets to write that stuff, or uh, some, a, a new art gallery exhibition that isn't terribly exciting, but it's just your daily stuff. But you have to, for the time you're working on it, be totally immersed in it. Even if you work on it for an hour, you talk to somebody, when you speak to somebody about, you interview someone about what they're doing, the thing they're working on, and how it's going to affect your community, for the time you're talking to them, they are the most important person on the planet. And, and that comes across. So you have to be invested in what you're writing about. Now having said that, after Skyway I wrote a biography of a record producer from St. Petersburg named Phil Gernhardt who had two number one records around the country. Well, three, actually. One, one he produced when he was in college in South Carolina, but a famous doo-wop record. Uh, that was very, very local. That was somebody I remembered from being a kid and, and looking at the names on 45 records. Uh, just the kind of person I was. And so I, it feels long gone as well, but I wrote a biography of him. Uh, the next book I had out was a collection of music interviews that I'd done for magazines. There's five interviews with Tom Petty, I think. That, uh, rock and roll stuff, which has kind of been my, my forte for a long time. Which brings me to now and why we're here. It's a long-winded way of explaining what vintage St. Pete is. With the Catalyst, as I, as I explained, I'm the arts editor, but I have kind of a free reign to... We're still making it up as we go along. The Catalyst is just three years old this month. So I started thinking about aspects of my city's history that I didn't read about anywhere else. Things that I remembered as a baby boomer growing up in St. Petersburg. We're talking about the tourist attractions. We're talking about historical events and people and things that don't seem to be in the history books that I remembered either fondly or just really well. And I wanted to learn more. And so, as I said, when you embark on finding out things, you have to be invested in it. For example, the story I did on uh, Tiki Gardens, which will come in here. I, I spent a month on that one talking to people, uh, you, you talk to people, kids who were kids then who worked there. There's a story in here about when Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio stayed up in Reddington Beach for nine days, nine years after their divorce. 
Well, I found men who had, and women who had worked at the Tides Motel on the beach then and remembered and told me about what they were doing. And one kid said, yeah, I used to drive them up to the wine cellar restaurant. I took her to get her hair done. Here's how they interacted with us. And so you're able to paint a portrait of this moment in history. If you're invested in it, your hope as a writer is that your reader is invested in it too. And so this book is really aimed at, I, I think, for two audiences. One, baby boomers such as myself who remember these things either fondly or, as I said, just kind of remember them. And people who had no idea about any of it. St. Petersburg today is, of course, very, very different from the St. Petersburg of the 60s and the 50s, the 70s, etc. There are a few things in this book, and we're going to talk about them chapter by chapter, but there are a few things in this book that happened before I was around that I had no idea about. This is the voyage of discovery I talked with you about. I found things from the 1930s, for example, that just boggled the mind. I'm going to tell you about a musical theater in the 1950s. I wasn't born yet. It, was only, it only lasted for two years. Um, so it's divided into four sections. Read. <laughs> and you said you weren't going to dance. <laughs> <laughs> There's sunken gardens. I grew up in St. Petersburg, and until my children were uh, 10 and 7 years old, I'd never been to Sunken Gardens. We lived in Gainesville, as I said, but we would come down to visit my parents. Oh, let's go here. I didn't know anything about the rich history of this place, which is still there, by the way. A plumber from Jacksonville named George Turner bought this acreage in the, in the 1920s. It was a sinkhole in the middle of it. He drank, he, somebody's nodding. She knows this story. Drained the sinkhole and started planting fruit trees. And man, did they grow because it was so fertile. There we go. So that's, that's Sunken Gardens. And there's an incredible, what is that, 70, 80 year history there, um, which is owned by this city now. Remember the Aquatarium? The Aquatarium was on St. Petersburg Beach. This was during the age of Flipper, of course, in the 1960s when, you know, Marine Land in St. Augustine is the first marine attraction in the world. It was built in 1938 and they used it as a film studio. So in the wake of that, and then when the TV thing happened, Flipper had started with a couple of movies, but it became a TV thing. Everybody had jumping dolphin shows. Why not put one on St. Petersburg Beach where the tourists were coming? So that was the Aquatarium. And I remember that very fondly, but what I also remembered was this. It was a place on John's Pass, if you know where John's Pass is, <laughs> that, that was called the Marine Arena. When I went there as a little teeny kid, it was called the John's Pass Aquarium. I found out that the gentleman who, that's him, his name was Jack Hurlbutt, built this adjacent to his bait shop in, uh, it was 53. He built, he was enamored with marine land. I found his son, who was eight years old, living in New York State, and we talked about it. And uh, Jack built a concrete tank that was approximately 40 feet long and maybe 25 feet wide and 10 feet deep. This bottomless dolphin, his name was Paddy, P-A-D-D-Y, lived in that tank for nine years. Dolphin was nine feet long, the tank was 10 feet deep. You can do the math. You'll also notice that there's, there's no sunlight getting in. <laughs> it was horrible. And, and in those days, they called them porpoises. They were, they were essentially just fish. Jack Hurlbut, by going through the newspaper archives, I discovered, had taken out a bounty on bottomless dolphins, $100 per. And there are photographs in the times of people bringing dolphins in, and they had died on the way. It was just another fish. We'll go out tomorrow and catch another one. Pretty awful stuff. By the way, Patty, when Jack, Jack Hurlbut closed because the aquatarium took all this business, he sold the dolphin to the aquatarium and died within a year, the aquatarium. The aquatarium also had a, a pilot whale for its first two years, and nobody talks about this anymore, but you can't really keep deep sea cetaceans, big tooth whales like that in captivity. It doesn't work. And that and the whale's name was Jonah, it was a female, go figure. Th that also died, and they kind of erased that from everybody's memory. That, that's the marine arena, that's a postcard. And the building still exists. It's called uh, Wild Style Swimwear on John's Pass. And if you go, if you go inside, you see over here is where the uh, the, the covered, uh, you know, marine arena was, where we sat on um, 
benches, you know, around the side. Anyway, if you go to One Style Swimwear, you can still see the roof that Jack Hurlbut built over Patty. You, and and the, <laughs> this is so funny, the, uh, the, the, the walls of the swimwear shop are built inside the concrete tank. It is still there. And they know, if you ask them, they'll show it to you. So that was something, I didn't find this in the history books. This is interesting to me. This is another, another sort of aspect of St. Petersburg life. Talk a lot about Web City, no. about Talk Web. <laughs> Rui Farias is a friend of mine, is the, the uh, head of the, uh, the director of the St. Petersburg Museum of History, and he's an expert on Doc Webb in Web City, which, as you know, was, this is where One Stop Shopping originated. He actually had, the, I think, the first escalators mm -hmm. uh, in, maybe in Florida, uh, Long Pond. And a lot of people today, they go, what, what the heck was that? Or I've heard my grandparents talk about Web City. 77 individual stores with several city blocks. I mean, he sold tires, he sold cars. He, uh, Anyway, it's a whole lot. I'm, I'm skimming through these. Uh, there's a whole lot about Web City in the book. And there's Doc. That's just a picture that I happen to like. Uh, he was five foot four, I think. Uh, Spitfire. You know, he was a, he was a P.T. Barnum. He was a, a raconteur and, a, and a, you know, a, a salesman, a natural salesman. This is Tiki Gardens. Tiki Gardens uh, was out on... Uh, Reddington Beach, it no longer exists. It was uh, sold in the 80s, and a few years later the city bought it and raised it to the ground, and it's now beach parking. But if you go out and park for the beach, there's a huge chain link fence at the back, and that's the remains of, of the park. The, uh, the, cats, the county owns it, I'm sorry, and, and the county unlocked the gate and let me in. And I walked around back there, and parts of those things still exist, but they've all caved in on themselves. It's very Indiana Jones. It was very much like a, a you know, an archaeological thing to go back there. But the whole story of, of Frank and Joe Byers and Tiki Gardens and Trader Frank's restaurant, and the, the record album they made, which is hilarious. Uh, it's like field recordings of, of peacocks squawking. And uh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> remember the MGM Bounty was uh, docked at the St. Petersburg Pier. Uh, this, was the, this was a replica of the ship, uh, the original HMS Bounty uh, of the famous story. This was built for the uh, 62 film with Trevor Howard and Marlon Brando. And it was a, a St. Petersburg attraction for many, many years. It, of course, sunk in 2012 in Hurricane Sandy, but that's getting past ourselves. I spoke with adult people who were children then, whose parents, who Mostly their, their dads. I talked to the captain's son. I, he was the captain of the ship. He was an actual captain. Hugh Boyd, he's still alive. Uh, and, and, so, and he also ran the attraction. And the gift shop manager. I talked to the ship's carpenter. Who's, and their kids told me all these stories about how they'd have to go down there every weekend and kind of hang around. And they pretty much hated it. They loved the ship, but it was, they said it was kind of boring. So that, that was an interesting way to, to find out more about that. There's the London Wax Museum, two of my favorite tableaus here. Anybody remember the London Wax Museum on St. Petersburg Beach? I spent a lot of time with Rob Stambaugh, whose father, Ted, who was the director of this place, told me how it happened and didn't happen, and all about the Chamber of Horrors. And uh, this was one of my favorite places when I was a kid, mostly because it was so cheesy. And anybody you talk to who remembers it will tell you that. The next part is uh, focuses on history. and. Uh, these are some of the ones that go back a little bit further, and uh, just trying to uh, trying to understand more about my hometown, Fort DeSoto uh, Park. Fort DeSoto is a state park. These are the uh, the cannons never fired at Battery Lately, which is essentially all the remains of Fort DeSoto, which dates from the Spanish American War. Um, what a lot of people didn't remember was that when it opened in '62, I think it was, it opened as a tourist attraction. Henry Fonda was here and did the ceremonial speech to open the place. They had little toy trains. I took my sister and my lovely wife, Amy, we went out there before, before well, uh, quite a few years ago. And I'm saying to my sister, don't you remember they had little trains that ran around? She's going, no, I don't remember this at all. Then I found this postcard. <laughs> hey, she's like, so she hates it when they show her. Uh, and then I read about it. I figured, you, know, you just go back in time and, and learn. And of course, it's all gone now, all gone. As I told you, I, I think it was 62, um, she, 
to give a brief recap, she had been you know, locked up in the looming bin. She was on her downward spiral at this point. They were divorced nine years. She had just divorced Arthur Miller. Uh, DiMaggio was, was then the batting coach for the Yankees who were in spring training here. So he, uh, once she got out of the loony bin, he's, they remained friends. They spent, it was nine days, I think, out of the tides, uh, what we used to call the bath club when we were kids. Yeah, I, I love that you're nodding to all this stuff. Um, so they were out there and, you know, didn't meet the press that much, but as I said, I talked to people who worked there and got a kind of a complete story of their whole uh, time out there, and, and she was dead about a year later. So, this is the Earl Rash Wood Parade on 4th Street, on, right off 22nd, a little bit, it's like 24, 25 something. You may remember it as the Melting Pot Restaurant. If you go back before that, you might remember it as Roland Pierre's French Restaurant, which is my parents' favorite, like, let's put on the mink stole and the suit and go out to a fancy <laughs> dinner place. It was built by Earl Gresh, who was... In the 20s, he was a band leader. He cut a, he cut a whole series of 78s with, with the Gangplank Orchestra for Columbia Records. The Gangplank was uh, where Jungle Pride is now. There's a story in here about Al Capone and Babe Ruth and the Gangplank. Uh, but Earl Gresh, his wife, got tired of him touring and said, you need to find something to do and stay here, which he did. He was a wood carver. He built this place. And did some amazing, uh, amazing things. He carved a tackle box and lures for President Truman. Um, and, and Mamie Eisenhower wrote him a letter and said, can I get one for Ike, too? This is true. Uh, fascinating guy. In fact, I was, where was I? I was somewhere talking about all this. Oh, I was, I, I was on uh, TV the other day at the uh, WFLA studios talking about this book. And as I was leaving, a, a guy walks up to me and he says, I'm Earl Gresh's grandson, and, and oh, wow. you know, you got it exactly right, and I, I never heard of it. It closed the year I was born, so this is one of those things. But uh, yeah, Matthew Gresh, very cool. Uh, I, I, I remembered the Boyd Hill Nature Trail Zoo. It was quite odiferous, that's what the Times called it. Um, very primitive uh, zoological park. I had to find out all about who Boyd Hill was and what the purpose of this place was, which led me to a place called the Florida Wild Animal Ranch, which I wrote about recently that isn't in this book yet, because it predates this, and I didn't know about it at this time. Animals, uh, I, I don't know what else to tell you about it. It was, it was down there on, at the corner of Lake McGoy where the, the Boyd Hill Preserve is right now. And this is where, when you were a kid, you would go to see you know, monkeys, and those are chimpanzees, would probably bite that kid's finger off, you know. The photographs that I found are unbelievable because nobody, nobody knew or cared. It's kind of like the dolphin thing in those days. There's a whole complete history of the St. Petersburg Pier because I felt like I had to do it. Um, the St. Petersburg Pier goes back 130 years, as you know. So we talked about all of the various uh, incarnations of that. There's a story about, anybody know who that is? I do. Ralphie. Yeah. yeah. I interned with Ralph right after high school. And uh, Ralph Heath was one of the most brilliant people I ever knew. Um, Ralph started the Suncoast Seabird Sanctuary, and for a while, in the 70s and the 80s, he was one of the most famous people who lived here. Uh, if you follow him in the news, he's still around. He's had a sad decline over the years. Uh, I'm not really entirely sure what it is uh, due to, but uh, his sons took over the business and threw him out. And it's now called the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary, and they do great work. And um, you know, nobody talks about Ralph anymore, but uh, I remember him as uh, absolutely brilliant. What a, what a spark that guy was. This is, this is one of my favorite parts of the book, too. Uh, I found out about the St. Petersburg Operetta. What, what you notice here is that they're under a big top tent. Okay, <laughs> these, are, these are stars of Broadway. Well, they're people who've been on Broadway. And, uh, you know, maybe in the chorus or had third leads or things like that. But a company decided, I don't know how, to erect this tent and have a whole season of shows. This was on 4th Street around 93rd. Are you nodding? Do you remember the operetta? I don't either. Well, what year was that? This was 1951. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you a great story, though. I, uh, I, I started reading about this. What, what happened is at the end of the first season, big wind blows the tent over. Oh. 
they have to finish up in some high school auditorium. They were almost done. The second season and the third season took place in the Gay Blades roller rink, Kwanzaa Hut. Oh my God. They took it up. It was hilarious. So I'm reading about this, and, and somebody found a program from the third season, and I'm perfect, like crazy perusing it, and it said, official photographer Phil Graham. And here's a, he had a, ran a photo studio in town. Anyway, long story short, this is how investigations go. I, I, I don't know how I did it, but I found somewhere through social media and just sleuthing around Phil's son, Curtis, who still lives in town. And I reached him on the phone. First of all, they always think you're nuts when you call me. <laughs> always. And I said, I, do you remember any pictures of like people on stage under a tent? And maybe headshots, because he did all the headshots for the performance. And Curtis paused and he said, I have a box full of pictures like that. And we never knew what they were. He had no idea about the operetta. So there's a whole lot of photos. I go a little too far in this book about the operetta because I just love this stuff. There's four of his, four of his headshots. I put them all together. They're, you know, and a couple of them were signed to Phil. What a great guy, you know. And they did a whole season. They did light opera. They did musicals. They didn't do any dramas. Nobody wanted to see dramas. The other part of this thing was, the other part of this story was there was a, a, another tented musical theater place called the Treasure Island Music Circus that lasted for exactly three shows. <laughs> at the same time, at the same time, uh, Larry Hagman was one of the stage boys um, because they were connected with Broadway. You know, his mother was Mary Martin and uh, uh, Elaine Stretch was in one of the shows, a very young Elaine Stretch. It lasted, as I say, for three shows and then the, uh, nobody came. It was at the intersection of Gulf Boulevard where Central is. There was nothing out there then. The guy told the newspaper, I guess your audiences just aren't sophisticated. <laughs> but the opera lasted for three years before they fired the director and they ran out of money too. This is the Manhattan Casino, the historical um, kind of nightclub uh, in the African American part of St. Petersburg, in a place called the Deuces. That's Louis Armstrong in 1957. You'll notice that the audience is still fairly segregated. This was one of the few occasions that white people actually went down there. The Manhattan Casino's history is so rich, going back to the very late 20s when Elder Jordan built this place. It was, what, it was uh, part of what they called the Chitlin Circuit, where black entertainers had to go to certain places in certain towns, couldn't go to the white part of town, only play here. So it was essentially for African-American audiences. It fed about 300 people. Ella Fitzgerald sang there. Ray Charles was there every year for about 10 years. B.B. King was there every year for about 15 years. Uh, oh, the list just goes on and on. Dinah Washington, Etta James, uh, Muddy Waters, a lot, of, a lot of great blues people too. Um, so it was like this whole culture that you know, we white people across town had no idea about. And it, it burned out in 64, I think. And they're, they're trying to put a museum up there now. I hope they do. Gay Blades Roller Rink. My, my sister is five years older than me, used to skate at Gateways. And uh, there's, a, there's a great Facebook page. You know, we all have fond memories of Gabe Blades and, and skating is a big culture, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. And I enlisted those folks to help me. And the stories I got and the photos I got about this culture, that's, that's what these are kids, this is 65 or something, I think. And uh, that was their lifestyle, is what I was saying. They, you live to go to the roller rink. There's a whole history of the Bayfront Center, which of course is gone. And I, I won't bore you with the story. You probably know it. 7,000 seat arena where we used to go and see the uh, Ringling Brothers Circus every year. And uh, I saw some great rock and roll concerts in the 70s. They tore it down in 2004, and that's where the Dolly Museum is right now. The Bayfront also had a, a 2,000 seat theater adjacent to it. They kept that. That's the Maffey Theater now. So the arena's long gone. They, they, they played hockey in there. The Rowdies played soccer in there. We used to go ice skating, you know, do the Zamboni thing. And so that was part of my growing up, certainly. Dr. Paul Bear. I just figured I'd show his picture. Every Saturday morning. Every Saturday. <laughs> I'll be lurking for you. Yeah. Dick Bennett was a, an ad man, worked for WTOG. He developed this character in North Carolina where he worked before and uh, Dr. Paul Bearer was the longest, to date, the longest running TV horror show host in American history. He passed away in I think it was 96, but I spoke with his widow and some people who work with him and 
uh, it's just a, a profile, a portrait of somebody that I thought was important to Absolutely. my recollections of growing up in St. Pete. The last section is called the movies. Um, and it goes something like this. <laughs> this, is, this. This is a place called Sunhaven Studios that existed on Wheaton Island. This is the first movie studio in our area, the first movie production house. It was on Wheaton Island, and if I remember correctly, it literally only existed in 30 and 31. They made three films out there. They're all black and white. They're all really terrible. Okay, just forewarned. Um, but the history of the place was unbelievable. Um, Playthings of Desire, which is this one. That's the second one. The first one's called Chloe, and the third one's called Hired Wife. Um, I was able to track down a lot of the locations for this film and uh, kind of find out where they had done it. There, there's, there's one scene in Playthings of Desire where you can see the old Gandhi Bridge in the background. I mean, and all the interiors were done here. They built sound stages on Wheaton Island. Of course, this is all gone now, too. Um, that's Chloe, which you can buy now. They changed it years later to uh, Chloe Love is Calling You. That's not Chloe, by the way. Uh, vo voodoo and, you know, uh, it's god-awful. Anyway, Buster Keaton had a financial interest in this place very briefly. And there was a whole thing in the Times, Keaton to arrive tomorrow. You know, second only to Chaplin and Comet, you know, Firepower. And Keaton came in and never finished his first movie, uh, basically because he was a drunk. And it's, all, it's in a book, folks. This is Robert Altman's Health. It was filmed entirely at the Don Cesar in 1979. Starred Glenda Jackson, Lauren Bacall, James Garner, and Carol Burnett, and Dick Cavett. Surefire hit, Robert Altman. It had only been a few years since Nashville. Uh, he was making a film a year in those days. This was, this actually began the long stretch of Altman's decline until he came back with, say, The Player and Shortcuts and those cool movies later. This movie, Ronald Reagan had this screen at Camp David and pronounced it the world's worst movie. <laughs> it is... It's not an exaggeration. You've seen it. You, no, it's it's on YouTube. It's awful. awful. It's awful. And, uh, oh yeah, let's not, let's not jump ahead. It's the only picture from that one I have. Uh, but there, there's, there's stills from the film in the book, and uh, Roy Peter Clark, who's a, a, a writing instructor at the Pointer Institute, and, and a guy that I, I happen to know, was a reporter, and he you know, interviewed all the stars and all, and he was, he was allowed free access to the thing. So I called up Roy, and I said, well, what was it like? And he said, well, we were all really enthusiastic in the beginning, but he said, Altman would let me go and watch the rushes at the end of the day. And he said, pretty soon I could see that it was going to be really, really bad. And uh, it never got released. That's the point. Never, never on a home video. No DVDs, nothing. It's called Health in all capitals with periods like MASH, right? Mm -hmm. uh, don't buy it. Let's just put it that way. But it was a great story. You know, people remember that. And of course, Cocoon was made, Ron Howard was here in 1984. And a lot of this has been well documented uh, because it's probably the most famous film that was ever made here. Um, this, <laughs> this pool existed in the back of a, a, one of those uh, fairly rich homes out on uh, Park Street, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the, the location manager found it and they built the pool house all around it so the three old guys could slip in and go swimming in secret. And then the aliens come and bring the cocoons into the water and you know the whole story. So when the um, film company left, as they have to do contractually, they tore it down and just left the pool the way it was. Okay, the people who own the house, who I didn't even try to speak to because I, I don't want to bother them. It's, it's in the record. They built another one. It looks just like the one in the movie because they thought it was so cool that they had it. I learned all kinds of things by reading the newspaper archives about the making of this film. For example, if you, if you remember... The, the aliens come up in a boat behind the house and they load the cocoons off. And there is a dock behind this house, but what you don't realize is that the water right there at that dock was only about this deep, right up at the dock. They couldn't bring a boat with a, with a, with a deep draft in there, so they built a replica of the boat. It's called the Menta, that was all fiberglass and completely devoid of anything under the water line. And so they could just put it there and carry the cocoons off. That's Hollywood. Uh, anyway, that's the, uh, that's the full cover there, the left and the right. And there are 22 stories. Uh, I, we have them here uh, for, for 
virtuous. If you'd like to, uh, <laughs> like to purpose. I, I, I hope we get the new volume too. I've, I've, I did a whole above and beyond this book. I did, I did a, a whole thing on the history of the Don Cesar, which it's not in the book. Came out later. Uh, I did a whole. One of my favorites was to do the history of dinner theater here, with with, Show with the showboat yes. and the country dinner playhouse. Yes. Uh, and I found so many people who remembered that so fondly. You know, and great photographs too. And I went and talked to a lot of the old actors and the people who worked those circuits. Uh, and the son of the, the, I found relatives of Dow Sherwood from the show, but, and also um, the, the folks from the, uh, from the Country Inner Playhouse. And uh, then when Dawn Wells passed away recently, I, uh, I remembered that she, she's the MVP. Dawn Wells from Gilligan's Island was the MVP. She had seven or nine local dinner theater appearances. She had a house here briefly. She dated Ralph Heath briefly. I remember Ralph talking about her. Um, so when Dawn passed away, I remembered I had a photo that I hadn't used of her with the cast at the Country Dinner Playhouse, you know, just a nice post photo. So I used that when I wrote an obituary, and, you know, local connection. So hopefully there'll be a, a volume two. I'm working on one right now about the Beach Theater out on the St. Beach. Um, but it's still a voyage of discovery. Another one that I, that I did not so long ago. Does anybody remember the Criswell Money Museum on St. Pete Beach? No, nobody remembers it. <laughs> Grover Criswell was the uh, was was an acknowledged expert on Confederate money, and you still talk to people, the coin collectors and, and Bill. You know, it's a hobby. You still talk to people. Well, yeah, he was a legend. They called him Colonel Criswell. He was a great big guy with a Colonel Sanders strut. You know, but before before that. He's on to tell the truth. I found this, by the way. He was the mayor of St. Petersburg Beach. And he and his brother had been profiled in the, as teenagers in the newspaper as already being experts in Confederate money, which nobody cared about then, believe you me. But he opened this museum with all his rare coins and, and his Confederate stuff, and it was robbed within the first month. And it, it only lasted a couple of years, but uh, watching him on to tell the truth was great. He was, so proud of what he was doing, and he's long gone now, but an interesting guy. Who knew, right? And that's because I was working on these stories, and you find like a 1962, 63 list of top tourist attractions in St. Petersburg, and it'll say, the Bounty, well, the Bounty's like, the Aquatarium, the Wax Museum, Tiki Gardens, and then it'll say, Criswell's Money Museum. So, I of course made a note. You know, and, and then later on when I was, okay, what do we do now? I said, let me look into this. And I found, the two brothers were very close in age, and I found uh, Grover's younger brother. He, he's 80 or 90 somewhere, and we had a long talk about his brother. And so you make the history come alive a little bit, and that's why I hope that I put it into these stories a little bit. That's all I got, folks. If there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to.